Oh my gosh. I literally like fucking horses. I slept with seven different horses. If you meet a horse at a bar and you guys are into each other, maybe you're making out a bit, entering the horse's mouth, and they're closing down the bar and it's time for you guys to go home, what I think you should do is say, would you like to come over to my stable for intercourse? Do you have an S? No? Then saddle up, partner. Hi guys, it's Madison back in my blue chair for another crazy video. Yeah, today's gonna be an interesting one. I'm really excited, just kidding. Not super excited to dive into this subject just because I'm visualizing the hours that I'm about to spend editing, having to watch these videos over and over and over again. So yeah, give a thumbs up for that, I guess. I've covered a lot of, what do you call them? douchebags on my channel. But recently, the internet has exploded with one big doo-doo pile of diarrhea. And this douchebag of the day's name is Russell Hartley. If you don't know who Russell Hartley is, you're about to find out and I apologize in advance. But if you do know who Russell Hartley is already, Today, I'm gonna talk about how Russell Hartley is playing us all for a fool. But first, before we get into the video, if you enjoy deep dives and like to analyze scams and unethical business practices going on on the internet, don't forget to subscribe down below and give this video a thumbs up if you like this video. And well, let's get into it. Also, don't forget to follow my husband and I's podcast, We'll be launching a video soon. So Russell Hartley, AKA Wolf of Wall Street wannabe, number 3,118, gained notoriety initially through his TikToks. You know, great ones like these. Hey, come look at this. <laughs> And these. How I convinced my girlfriend to have a three-way, part three. Why women cheat in relationships, part four. To clarify, being gay. And these. Now is it just me or is everybody else getting bored of women just posing for their iPhones? Like this. It's so boring. It's like, you got nothing else. You can't do anything else than that. And I call them out. I mean, I say, look, you guys are just making these posts for attention from men and they get all up in arms and they're like, no, I, I post these videos for me. Really, for you. He's also a known lover of horses. There you have it, folks. It's straight from the horse's mouth. And of course, yet another internet misogynist though I would say his douchebaggery exceeds his misogyny. You may know Russell Hartley from the various YouTube videos that are like, OMG, look at how bad this guy is, AKA the one you're watching right now. But what if I told you that all of this internet hate, outrage and videos and general noise, ah, and general noise surrounding Russell Hartley was actually exactly what he wanted. I'm sure we wouldn't be surprised. Guys like Russell usually want everyone talking about them, whether good or bad. But today we're gonna talk about outrage marketing, how effective it can be, and how people like Russell are using it through social media for their own financial gain. So first, what is outrage marketing, otherwise known as shock advertising? Shock advertising is a type of advertising that deliberately, rather than inadvertently, startles and offends its audience by violating norms for social values and personal ideals. It is the employment in advertising or public relations of graphic imagery and blunt slogans to highlight a public policy issue, goods, or services. Shock advertising is designed principally to break through the advertising clutter, to capture attention and create buzz, and also to attract an audience to a certain brand or bring awareness to a certain public service issue, health issue, or cause. So basically, shock advertising 
is meant to shock you. Shocking, right? Because there's so much online noise nowadays, it's really hard to catch people off guard. It's really hard to draw their attention. So how do you do that? You make really outrageous videos that piss a lot of people off or outrage them or shock them. Then all of a sudden you've got the attention, you've got the noise, and a lot of people think any publicity is good publicity. The more people are talking about you, the more notoriety you gain, the more followers subsequently follow. To me personally, it's a sinister way of marketing that celebrities and brands have been using effectively for ages. And now we have social media where people are building their own brands that they're able to use shockvertising on as well. And of course, Russell Hartley is not the only example of this. There are so many social media influencers that use shock advertising or have used shock advertising, and it's effective. It's actually scary how effective it is. <laughs> One of, in my opinion, the most effective ways to grow a platform on social media. It makes me wonder if I should develop a shocking brand. What would that even look like? I don't know. So let's examine some of Russell Hartley's TikToks to see what message he's spreading exactly. Having two separate girlfriends Part one. Now I'm not perfect and I wouldn't say that I'm proud of this particularly, but I've learned a lot of lessons and I think it's important that I share with you my experience with how this plays out. Let's start with how I met the first girlfriend. So I'm at Walmart getting groceries and I'm carrying out these groceries to my car and some girl comes up and taps me on the shoulder and I'm like holding these groceries and she says, hey, uh, my friend thinks you're cute. And I look across the way and I see an ombre blonde girl who's tanned like a baked potato dressed head to toe in a Hooters outfit standing in the Walmart parking lot. And I was like, oh my God, that's my dream. I mean, what more could you ask for? Anyways, we dated for the rest of the summer and she ended up moving in with me in Charleston. So now I'm living with this girl and she's upgraded from being a Hooters girl to being a full-time stripper. Also, she's going to nursing school full-time. I know, a walking cliche. Anyways, I was in love, and we dated like that into my school semester. First off, I love how he's like, I was in love, but the only thing he ever mentions about this girl is her appearance or very shallow and surface level aspects about her. Cool, cool. Also, likely story. So likely. But I will say, he structures his TikToks very intentionally. It's a story, it's meant to grab you in. There's multiple parts, so you visit his profile, you engage with each story, you follow it along. He tries to make it as captivating and interesting as possible. You know, like fairy tales? You know how like fairy tales are like one of the most interesting things to listen to? Um, yeah, it, it's kind of like a fairy tale, you know, like especially the fictional aspect. And uh, he's, he's good at that, for sure. He's definitely a great storyteller. To clarify, being gay. Once again, he wants to rope people in with these controversial taglines. Why is that, do you think? So many of my comments are about, like, me. Like, oh, you're gay, come out of the closet already, whatever. And since when is being gay like a negative or derogatory thing? And what's worse than that is the majority of these comments are coming from the alt or the LGBTQ plus community. So why don't girls like weak dudes? You know what? I don't want to date a weak dude. <laughs> there you have it, folks. Just straight from the horse's mouth. It totally ropes into the whole alpha male conversation, which let me know if you want me to do a video on alpha male influencers. It's a really interesting phenomenon, but it's just like not true. Not true at all. These alpha male influencers, similar to Russell Hartley, portray this image of like, if you want to get a girl, you have to be strong and tough and also see women as objects because that's what women like. None of it is true from my personal experience, which funny enough, I was a model in LA since I was 14 to 18. As you'll see, kind of the group that Russell associates being involved with. What is like dating models in Hollywood? Part five. Yeah, and I would say personally, I do not give a shit about any of this kind of stuff. Any of it. 
But also, I have some other problems to say on that whole subject, which we will get into. What is like dating models in Hollywood? Part five. Anyways, I haven't talked to the Russian girl since, but whatever, that's the nature of the game. They come and go, it is what it is, it's no big deal. You find, I, fall, I literally, walking around on the streets of LA, I fall in love with a new girl every day. And dating models in LA is great because you never have to worry about them being like out of shape or gaining weight or whatever, because they're already so hard on themselves. It's absolutely perfect. And as long as you have the resources and the social status, I mean, you can pull them as often as you meet them. I mean, it's really amazing. I mean, these girls aren't gonna be wifey, but like, who said anything about marriage? But full disclosure, I have met models that I've entered into a serious, committed, monogamous relationship that went on for years. So it is a case by case basis, but for the most part, I'm just letting you know, this is what it's like. And you gotta have a strong constitution to date really high end models because they have a huge following on social media. They're waking up to 30 DMs from dudes that are like, good morning, beautiful, and all this stuff. So you gotta be able to handle that. And that's exactly why high end models don't date weak dudes. And you have to have enough resources to provide because she's not working. I know a lot of models in LA who make a really good amount of money. Really good. They're very resourceful. It's a career like anything else. You have to, as Gary Vee says, hustle. Just kidding. But you do, you have to, you know, be really resourceful. You can't just depend on castings to get you jobs. It's not always going to be the case and it's very hit or miss. How I convinced my girlfriend to have a three-way part two. So I'm at this club in Hollywood every Wednesday night. I mean, that's pretty much the spot to go. And when you go often enough, you start to know everybody there because there's other regulars just like you. They're like, hey, what's up? You guys never hang out outside of the club, but you know everybody basically in the venue. The bartenders know you and it's all cool. And when you become a regular like I was, am. Like I was, was am. Like I was at that one time that I went to a club that I'm referencing in all of these, or I mean, that, that I am. What a try hard, especially to use woman like that in a video and then in another video, make fun of girls for thirst trapping. But you're literally thirst trapping in your own videos with other women's bodies. Like you are literally thirst trapping with some of these videos, yet you shame women for doing the same thing. Okay, this is the other thing that confuses me. LA girls, let me know if you feel the same way. I've been out of the LA scene for a long time, but I don't see dudes that actually have connections, dudes that are actually like connected into the LA scene, don't wear suits. They don't. They wear like black t-shirt, black jeans, like some sort of black jacket. That's what every dude in LA wears. So I really feel like this guy is completely full of doo-doo. I keep seeing so much lately that women are living their life on easy mode, and I'm here to tell you that that's absolutely true. But only in direct proportion to how pretty they are and how much they put themselves out there, like on social media or whatever. Here's an idea. I like working on my stuff because it brings me joy. It flex our socioeconomic status to pay for them and take them on expensive trips and like take them to cool parties, stuff like that. And girls, especially on social media, are super aware of this. That's why basically every TikTok trend is just some new excuse to show some part of their body. That's just marketing. And I'm all for it. I mean, some of my best relationships have started from a thirst trap. And some women will say, oh, that's just shallow, or there are white knights out there that'll be like, well, I'm not shallow, I go for personality. Really? If you were physically attracted to her in the first place, you wouldn't have even talked to her at all. What are you talking about? And as a man, you may be living your life on hard mode now, but if you're willing to work, you can increase your marketability as a high value mate every single year forever. And women don't have that luxury. Instead, they get easy mode for now. It's the easy mode, gang. It's the lack of the acknowledgement of the female struggle for me. Rules for picking up women in clubs, rule number five. Always have a reason to bring her home. And once you guys are at the point of making out of the club and- No one goes home after the clubs. They go to after parties. What are you talking about? I know. 
My husband says he just wasn't invited. I always have a reason. Like for me, it's like, hey, I got a dog at home. His name's Max. He's super cute. You should meet him. They always want to meet him. Or I'll say, oh, I have Mario Kart. And every girl, for some reason, every girl under the age of 25 is like, oh, I'll kick your ass in Mario Kart. Oh yeah? Prove it. <laughs> We've never once played Mario Kart. Also, is anyone else creeped out by the lack of expression on his face? Either he has a ton of Botox or I don't know. I've never once seen a guy like Russell Hartley in any place in LA. And if he was, he would be spotted immediately and kicked out of every single club, especially the VIP section where models are. Also, it doesn't seem like he knows anything about what he's talking about. And sometimes I would be like unsure, like, oh, I don't know or whatever. And you go, oh yeah, no, I have to work in the morning anyways. You can't stay or anything. You're just gonna meet Max and you gotta get going. Or we're gonna play one round of Mario Kart and then you gotta get going. Remember, I've never played Mario Kart with a girl, not once. <laughs> so always have a plan. Remember, a confident man has a plan. A cocky man doesn't think he needs one. Yeah, you guys know how horrible that is. I don't have to explain it. No. What it's like being a bachelor in real life, part one. Oh boy, I'm about to stir the pot on this one. About to stir the pot. I think that's really his intention, honestly. He wants to say controversial stuff that stirs the pot, gets people going, gets people talking about him, as I guess I'm doing now. So, fell for it, great. I wanna preface it with the fact that there are two types of bachelors. One, which is the majority of bachelors, where they don't get a choice. Bachelordom is sort of thrust upon them because of their lack of options with women. And two is when you have plenty of options with women, you just choose to remain single. We're gonna be talking about number two. And this is all based on my experience. If you watched some of my previous videos, you already know I've been in throuple situations, I've been in polyamorous situations, I've been in serious, long-term monogamous relationship situations. I mean, you name it, I've been there. And of those various kinds of relationships, which am I a fan of the most? I'm not exactly sure. There are pros and cons to each of them. And now before we begin, we gotta lay some terms down. To be a true bachelor, you gotta build what I call a stable. A stable is a rotation of women that you have available to you that you can hit up and they can go on dates with, hang out with, do stuff in the bedroom with, all of that. And you're not dating any of these women, you're still just sort of talking. And I know how this sounds, ladies, but trust me, I'm a romantic. That's also the funniest thing because the worst dudes I've ever met in my life have always called themselves a romantic. If someone ever calls themselves a romantic, run for the hills, run. Like just from personal experience, that's my advice. They either get creepy really fast or they're like trying to manipulate you. Anyways. Now what's so, so special about Russell Hartley is that he's sexist, but he's sexist in a way that not a lot of public figures are. He says a lot of outright offensive things in very harsh and crude ways, and I don't think it's as simple as he's just an asshole. I think he knows exactly what he's doing, and everyone is playing right into his hand. Is that how the saying goes? I don't know. So the thing about shock advertising or outrage marketing is you say something so controversial that people have to talk about it and they have to express how this controversial thing makes them feel, which is usually angry. So all that noise generates free publicity in a way. And even though the end result is that the majority of people who know about you hate you, the reality is a very small percentage of people might have the same thought process that you have that end up hearing about you and that small percentage of people might end up following you or purchasing some things you're selling. So even if 90% of the people that end up hearing about you and what you're saying are outraged by it, the fact that they're talking about it, you as a person, your platform, your message is spread to more and more people. And there may just be a small percentage of people that end up following you, that end up thinking this guy's a genius. <laughs> and, and then you're able to gain a small amount of following that you wouldn't have gained beforehand. So Russell capitalizes off of hate as much as he possibly can. He's even admitted himself, he's aware of how many views he gets from people reacting to his content in a negative way or criticizing his content. What happened when one of my TikTok videos went viral and then anti-viral? So for those of you who already follow me, you already know what's going on. But for the rest of you, hi, 
I'm Russell Hartley. I say some divisive shit, especially as it pertains to the relationships between men and women. So I posted a story around the time where the TV show The Bachelor was going on, it was very popular, and I did a story about what it was like to be a bachelor in real life. Anyways, one of the videos in that story gets like a million views, and it's like, great, and then move on with your life. Three weeks later, this girl does a duet with the video holding up a sign that says, I hate men, taking it completely out of context. And then, oh boy, did I get a surge of hate. I went from 1.1 million to 3 million views in an absolute storm of angry comments. And that hate bled over to some of my other social media accounts where people were putting laughy faces on all my photos because of a video I did about that. Anyways, that girl went from like 200 followers to 1,100 followers, and that original video ended up getting duetted like 300 times. And in the meantime, I'm getting like 900 new followers an hour. So I'm here to say, thank you, haters. And then I posted this, turning all that hate into overwhelming support. When prominent influencers do videos on him, like Curtis Connor, he makes it into this big deal. He reacts. He tries to get as much out of it as he can. Oh, well, that's basically Skillshare. Oh my gosh, this did a look on your face. Oh, oh my gosh! And that's what half-baked journalism gets you, Curtis Connors drumming up more attention and more noise. When he responds to defend himself, he doesn't really say anything at all. Usually the excuse is, oh, well, you took this out of context. This girl does a duet with the video holding up a sign that says, I hate men, taking it completely out of context. I was seeing some posts on my TikTok, like Curtis Connor needs to do a video about him. And like so many people do videos about me taking my stuff entirely out of context or turning it into something that it totally isn't, or whatever. And if you think about it, that's a very intentional way of wording things because people that are watching might think, oh, maybe they did take it out of context. Let me watch more of his videos to see if it's out of context or not. Let me view more of his content. And that's how you're roped in. Even in his TikTok bio, he advertises a podcast that he willingly did as Watch Me Get Roasted on Emily's podcast. So he's playing into this whole thing, the controversy, the hate, the negativity, the anger, he's playing into it. Call girls horses. <laughs> a stable. That every time you have sex with a new woman, that's a new mare in your stable. I can tell that guy ain't no cowboy. You don't put a bunch of damn mares in your stable together because they're gonna start biting and kicking and raising all kinds of hell. There you have it folks, straight from the horse's mouth. He knows that's what people want to see. He's like a talking meerkat. The whole spectacle is just so gross, but also fascinating that people just can't look away. But if you notice, he has his Instagram on private. His comments and duets are turned off. So while you might see valid criticism on other people's platforms, on his platform, when you're a follower of his, you can't see any of that negativity. You can't see comments talking about how wrong this is. So he's blocking out all that negative criticism for his actual legitimate followers. And my personal theory on that, why I think that is, is he doesn't want people in his comments talking about how blatantly wrong everything that he said is. Like women have made it very clear everything that he has said is just not true. It's not factual. Like, especially when it comes to how we respond to men and dating and dating advice that it's just not factual at all. But the thing is that's very damaging to a brand that's built all around having all of this valid, honest advice about dating, especially if you're selling something that has to do with giving advice to young men on um, not dating necessarily, but attracting women. And we'll get into that. Russell's content's main purpose is to piss off the majority of people who view it but piss them off so much so that they feel obligated to share, to talk about it, to be angry and voice their anger. On social media, engagement is everything. The more you engage with content, the more it's pushed out. So even if you engage with something in an angry way, thank you, hunbots who have commented hate comments and disliked my videos, just kidding. But um, the more you do that, the more that content is spread and shared. And then you're reaching more people, some of whom may actually identify with what you're saying, unfortunately. 
especially if they're, you know, men who have never actually talked to a woman before and believe that because you wear a suit and claim to be a frequent clubber of Hollywood that you know what you're talking about and so they listen to you, follow you, and buy your courses eventually. If you look at his content, most of it is this like extremely exaggerated fantasy story that's made to draw people in, either to piss them off or to make them feel like he's this like magical guru that has so much knowledge in getting women and I've never talked to a woman, I've never been with one, I don't know how they operate. Now, why is Russell doing all of this and making himself into such a hated person? It's definitely not to help men with dating or meeting or being with women in any way, shape, or form. In fact, pretty much the entire female population has said what this dude is saying is not true, it is not correct. The entire female population has literally said, this ain't it, sis, or bro, or whatever. The reason why Russell makes this type of content for all of this publicity, even if the majority of it is hate, is to capitalize off of the stupid men who actually believe what he's saying. The men that just can't talk to women because of their prehistoric sexism and just overall terribleness. So they listen to Russell and they're like, Haha, sounds about right. Women are stupid. Silly women didn't know he date both at once. Haha. Ha. And once Russell ropes in the stupid men, he can sell to the stupid men. Which, honestly, I don't know if that makes him a hero or not. Like, maybe thank you. Maybe he's like this, you know, undercover superhero that we didn't know we needed. Just kidding. He's still a douchebag. Because yes, Russell is selling a dating advice course. We love to see it. He's not a get rich quick guru, free bot scammer. No, he's a relationship guru scammer. You see, if you click the link in his Instagram bio, it takes you to a page called how to text a girl. Unlock the free video. Supercharge your texting. Discover the number one thing that dramatically improves your texting game with women. Then you enter your full name and your best email and you click, yes, I want to improve my texting skills. Take me to the video. Then if you scroll down, it says expert coach shows you how to never get flaked on again. So this is targeting dudes that get flaked on. So that's why he acts as if he's this douchebag bachelor player. He's targeting these dudes that get flaked on, that can't find a girl, that want to live that life, but they can't. And then he's selling them a texting course. The cheat codes to texting. Get her to happily give you her number. Text tutorials to increase response rates. Become irresistible over the phone. Easy first date, 0% flake chance. Kind of makes me feel so bad. He's targeting dudes that get flaked on. <laughs> How to get her back if she ghosts you. <laughs> it has a button that says, yes, I want to improve my texting skills. Some advice, Russell, if, if you do see this video, this is amateur free bot work. This is amateur guru scammer work. You have to have the red and green all over your webpage. It's a must. Every single other guru scammer does it. They have a web page. It says free everywhere. This, this button doesn't even say free. What are you doing? You got to have a green button. All the check marks have to be red. That's how every other guru scammer does it. Come on, Russell. Get your head in the game. Then you scroll down and it's just this woman with this like shocked face. Okay. No. Then at the very bottom, it says a word of warning. You will be seeing real texting examples. I want you to know upfront that there are a few things we won't tolerate. Using these strategies to manipulate women, they're that powerful. That reminds you of like 
when you go into an interview and it's like, well, what's your greatest weaknesses? And they're all your strengths. It's like, these are some bad things about the texting course, except for they're all like more sales tactics to buy it. Telling women about these hacks, they won't work anymore if everyone knows about it. Using any nudes you receive as blackmail. I mean, at least there's that. Then the final bottom of the page says, yes, I want to improve my texting skills with women. So all of this, the really, really weird videos, the crazy stories, the misogynistic tones, all of it is to rope ignorant, desperate men into following him and eventually purchasing his texting course. That's why he does it. And quite honestly, everyone who's talked about him, everyone who drums up noise around him is playing right into his hand of roping more and more of these men in, establishing himself as an expert figure and being a player and getting them to purchase his texting course so that they can not get flaked on. (laughs) Just so these men end up wasting money on a Russell Hartley texting course. So... I know you, like me, are probably dying to know what advice Russell Hartley is giving men in this texting course. And don't worry, because this is only the first part of a two-part series. And in part two, I myself am going to be buying the Russell Hart texting course and learn from Russell Hartley himself how to text women. So we're going to see what's in this course. Stay tuned. (music) 